Good evening and welcome back, family in music, to our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe. No stranger to the Jazz Cafe itself, but the first time on this program, we welcome with an eclectic mix of all kinds of jazz, Blue Orchid. Our first tune is You and the Night in the Music, as played by Stan Getz, Bill Evans, the trio from the But Beautiful album, arranged by our masterful bass player, Kiffin. Call should I? It's a little thing that that I wrote. Hope you enjoy it.
Zampetti. <clears throat> the name is Captain Blue for his buddy Rob.
What jazz set <clears throat> can be considered complete if you don't have a rhythm change of song. <clears throat> Here's something I wrote a few years ago called Bird Dog. Thank you. 
Well, Blue Orchid, thank you gentlemen for introducing us to a fantastic first set of music. Originals always make my heart sing, so we're definitely going to have to talk about these compositions we're getting to experience here tonight. And to do that, I think I understand several of you, maybe all of you in the interview. Yeah, I think we all want to respond to your question. Fantastic. The other thing I wanted to mention, and if you haven't already figured it out, is we have a 40-year difference in age through our ensemble. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yep. That's kind of an interesting feature. Let's talk about that right over here. Well, Blue Orchid, thank you so much for that first set of music. We're, of course, looking forward to set two. You know, before we got started, the museum, those of you at home, the little ghosts who live here, tried to keep us from getting going. But we rebuked them, <laughs> and the fellows took to the craft with mind, body, and soul. So we've got a concert for you tonight. Gentlemen, before we get into our discussion, where we'll learn a little bit about the band and each one of you, will you take the moment to tell us something about yourselves in your own words? Joe, why don't you start? All right, well, um, well, I'm Joe, as Patrick said. I, I, start, I started with this group about maybe, what, three or four years ago? Three or four. Um, three years. The story is that they asked for somebody inexperienced so they could help that musician grow. But at the time, I didn't know that. I actually only learned that until like a month ago. Oh. It was very funny to me. And, you know, uh, the director of the program dropped my name when people were seeking inexperience. But... I'm flattered to be here, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to have grown and fit better with these group of amazing musicians right here. Joe, I'm gonna to wanna to know more about that in a little bit. I'll be happy to piggyback off of that, because Joe can thank me for that. So my name is Kippen, <laughs> and I have been in this group pretty much since the beginning. I think we've been about eight years now going. Um, and it's evolved over time, and we've had a couple of different piano players come with us throughout, um, throughout our time together. And when our previous pianist left, I wrote to the jazz director of VCU and I said, you know, I want somebody who can really grow up with us and take what they're learning from us and really use that to elevate their musicality. And so I asked for a couple of suggestions and um, the director named Joe as one of his people. So we brought him in and ended up having a rehearsal with him and knew that we would be able to work well with him, uh, just as a person, but also as a musician. So mm. Joe is now with us. And Hopefully for a little while longer, <laughs> well, a lot, lot long, longer. Um, my background, I started, oh my goodness, in 2004. Um, I was determined to play flute, but I am high, uh, pin high frequency. So I cannot hear the flute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the irony of being able to play a flute, but you can't hear the flute. So that didn't work out, needless to say. I ended up doing vocals for a while before settling on bass. Um, they're picking up guitar, drums, piano, a couple other things along the way. And uh, went to VCU School of Jazz myself, graduated 2016. Here I am. Well, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Myrick. Uh, I'm Myrick Crampton. I had three careers. I wanted to be a musician. My parents said, uh, when you go to college, get a backup degree. <laughs> they didn't call it STEM at the time. So I got a degree in mathematics and computer science. All right. So I worked on satellites in space. I worked on supply chain optimization, factory scheduling problems, did research and development in that. My last career was in a hedge fund, and boy, did that open my eyes. <laughs> um, so once that, once I was able to retire from that, uh, we looked around. You know, what college do I want to go to? I want to go study music. It's either that or a PhD in math. Mm -hmm. So I figured music. You know, because on my deathbed, if I didn't try that music thing, I knew I'd always regret it. So. That's where I met Kiffin. I went to VCU, and uh, we've been playing and being friends ever since. Well, welcome back to the stage, Myra. Thank you. And Mr. Band Leader. Um, I'm the outlier in the band. I do not have a music degree from uh, a college. These gentlemen all are um, graduates of VCU. We're about to be graduates yes. of VCU and the jazz program, the very fine jazz program. Um, I started uh, when I was nine years old, and started playing drum set, played in some church groups, mm -hmm. uh, did some singing back then, and uh, got involved with marching percussion through okay. the local drum and bugle corps. Okay. And so I did a lot of rudimental playing, uh, ended up marching with one of the top groups in the country, a world champion group. Um, after that was over, I took some uh, 
music lessons over at the Drummers Collective in Manhattan, oh. where I was working at the time uh, with uh, the late Kim Plainfield and with Peter Erskine, who's one of my faves. Okay. And uh, then uh, the next phase of music was teaching marching bands, high schools, and eventually UVA is marching band, which I taught for eight years. Um, but that's all kind of my side hobby hustle um, work. What I really do is I'm an architect. Oh. Um, I design, uh, as a matter of fact, the next venue that we're going to play at over at Brambley Park is um, a venue that I had designed with my company. Uh, been going for about 35 years now, have my own company for 28 years. And I just want to mention one thing, uh, my connection to the, the VMFA, my son was a a docent in training here through the Center for the Arts okay. and also received a, a National Art Award in this very uh, room that we're in here and they <laughs> celebrated the, the youth that were receiving awards nationally. So it's kind of a special night for me to be here. Uh, uh, my son Joseph was uh, an award recipient here. Well thank you for sharing that with us and welcome back to the space then. I didn't realize that before. Yeah, that's kind of neat. Tell, let's, st let's stick here with you, Patrick, if you don't, don't mind. Uh, your love for music, how has it remained so strong and how do you find, I've never been an architect, it seems very challenging to me, how do you find time to keep up with your skill? I see a lot of connections between music and architecture. There's a, a famous quote that architecture is frozen music. Mm. And I've always kind of thought about that quote. We, in my design work, we're often dealing with pattern and rhythm and a sequence of events as people enter a structure. Right. And there's a lot of that in music too. Um, I. I got brave uh, about a year ago and started trying to compose music. I don't have any of the training to do that. Mm. I just have my ear that's been kind of trained over 30, 40, 50 years now uh, being playing music. And so it was a lot of fun. Uh, I got a lot of help from Kiffin and Myrick putting together the arrangements of some of my compositions. We got to hear one tonight. Yes. It's my first uh, composition that we actually played. Oh, wow. uh, but the love of music is strong. My wife. Uh, and I met in a band, and uh, I always tell everyone that she's the percussionist, I'm the drummer, uh, <laughs> because she knows everything about keyboards and timpani yeah. and uh, tuned percussion uh, as a, a great player and a great teacher. Uh, for me, it's just been kind of learning by rote and using my ear every chance I get to add something rather than detract from the ensemble. Well, we got to hear a little bit of that tonight. I'll, I'll say well done to you, Thank sir. You. Kiffin, tell me about the process. What is it like to compose jazz music? Uh, well, I'll admit I'm probably the least orthodox way of doing that. Um, so I kind of have two different approaches. One feels a little bit more forced than the other. Hmm. Uh, one is to just kind of go understand what came before me and try and imitate that to the best of my ability. And, study form and chord changes and mm. chords themselves, harmony, structure, melody. Um, but actually the, the way that I write some of my best stuff and some of the stuff that we're playing tonight um, oftentimes is, I guess you could say, more of a spiritual journey mm. in that mm. um, a, a song we're not playing tonight. But one of the songs that I wrote, I met somebody on an elevator and that person just kind of stood out to me in a special way that really no rhyme or reason why. But I ended up going to my room afterwards, and I just sat down and I wrote a melody. And I have no memory of how I wrote it. All I remember is writing like the first two lines of it, and then everything else just kind of pulled itself together. Wow. And um, the songs that I feel the most connected to are written that way. Uh -huh. um, it, it's definitely more of an emotional pull than a theoretical pull. You know, I, I, I'm a composer. The camera knows that. Um, I'm with you. The, the, my best work, I think, and also the things I, I, I feel like the things I connect with most are just that way, come from someone's heart. And then they put technique and, and theory on top of it, but it's, it's that connection. I re recently talked with the emotions and Wanda Vaughn said, the heart of music is the art. And I, I loved that. Yeah. Thank you, Wanda. <laughs> Joe, you're learning. I learned something about you earlier. You're still learning the craft. Yeah. Tell me what it was like <coughs> to have the opportunity to be picked to play with a group that is seasoned and plays well together and what sorts of things are you learning? Well, the entire feeling kind of starts from when I was young because like when I was four years old my parents put me into a piano studio hmm. 
So I don't remember actually starting music, and in my conscious memory, it's just always been there. And from what I remember being, it was definitely more classical based, my training. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling like I had the talent and I had the skill, but I knew in my heart that it wasn't exactly where I belonged. Because I remember when I was going into college and graduating high school, I was extremely ready to never play piano ever again, which was wow. interesting because all it took was maybe a few months of these private lessons that VCU offered for jazz piano. You could take it whatever major you wanted. You just had to talk to the you know, director of the piano program. And all it took was just a few lessons. I remember the first thing, one of the first things my teacher asked me when I walked in, in front of that piano. He said, what do you want to learn? And just in that one sentence, I just, it started to build. And I was like, I realized I could do whatever I wanted with what I already have. Hmm. And music had always been something that I was just doing for either my parents or my teacher, and not never, very rarely for myself. But I had all this experience, I had all this music, I had all this love in my heart for it that I was almost ignoring. And the key to unlocking it was learning that I could do whatever I wanted with it. Mm. And it's been a lot of bravery. It's, it hasn't been just learning music, learning piano, learning chord changes. It's been getting out there and taking my chances mm. and trying less to be shy and trying to talk more on camera maybe. <laughs> it's, it's been good. And these guys were here at a very, very um, early period of that because I don't even remember being able to comfortably solo mm. when mm. they first asked, but I was like, we're gonna try it today. This is gonna be great and here I am. What was it about this young man here that made him the selection? You had several to choose from. What got Joe the gig? Well, it, I really wanted somebody who I knew would benefit. And the backstory behind that was when I was first hired by the original piano player, and Patrick, that I was kind of very much in the same position as Joe. I was a mm. sophomore in VCU at that point. And um, had never really had any kind of performance opportunity. I played in a high school big band, but it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of personal growth in that group. And by playing with both Patrick and the other guy, Alex, uh, I started having more personal growth, mm. um, not only as a musician, but as a person as well, and as a businessman, mm. and as a role model. And so after I graduated, I realized that I was pulling so much from that, that it would be a shame to not have somebody else be able to experience that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was really my goal. I wanted intentionally to start with somebody who hadn't had very much exposure to playing out Mm. so that they could develop into whatever person they wanted to be as a musician and as a person. That's really beautiful, uh, Kiffin. I, I talk a lot on this program that, about great educators making all the difference in the world, a great education, the way you respond to that education. And to your point, realizing you had an experience younger and you want to pass that on. I think about being younger than Joe, high school and younger, and the experiences I had that led me to this conversation we're having now. Yeah. Well done for sure. We didn't forget about you, Myrick. Oh, good. <laughs> Tell me what it's like playing with these guys. Oh, it's, it's fun because uh, when, when I compose and I arrange, I look for moments, mm -hmm. um, special moments, and I look for, for complex emotions. Like Mahler, when you listen to Mahler, oh, boy. you hear the sentimentality and, and, and you, this wisdom and age in his music, and that's just astounding every time, yes. every time you hear it. And so guys like that are the guys that can create these moments in the music that just, you know, the hair on your arms mm -hmm. goes up and you feel the sense of awe. Yeah. So what I try to do in my music is create those moments. So when we get to rehearse, we, we look for those moments and we try to find a way that we can all bring our individuality to expressing that moment. And then if you play the same song with two different bands, the moment's different. Mm -hmm. and if you play it on two different nights with the same band, the moment's different. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think it's special with groups like this. Each one has an a individual personal style. And when you, when you can find a moment and you can express it as a group, you can really enjoy the organic, that organic moment at that time. Ensemble playing, that's what that's yeah. called. And Mahler, y'all stay tuned. I've got some Mahler coming for you next yeah. year, yeah. 2022. Um, how do you, what's the decision-making process like when someone brings in a new composition 
and you decide whether or not you're going to grapple with it. We'll give it a, a, for an initial read, I guess, and see if it starts to connect with, uh, with the band. We've done that with a few pieces. Some have been successful, some require more work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we all made a conscious decision to try to take the ensemble playing to the next level. And in order to do that, we need Myra uh, primarily as leading us through these moments that he's trying to create. Mm -hmm. I, I refer to them as arrival points in the music. And we all want to kind of arrive together uh, from the same spot. Uh, so we're trying to add more uh, musicality. We're playing more dynamic, more phrasing. Um, more impact. Um, I, I just, I have to say this though, when I heard the, the compositions from Myrick and Giffen, they to me sounded like standards that have been around for 30 years. Mm. I mm. mean, when you listen to Giffen's, the ballad that we play tonight, Old Man's Tale, I mean, it, it is so evocative, it yeah. is so cinematic in, in the sound yeah. that it's generating. And you listen to it and say, wow, I'm, I'm feeling this, this old man's tale. Um, uh, and then having Myrick with all of his other band experience, because he plays with a lot of other groups, mm -hmm. and we're lucky to have him play with us, um, that brings so much to the group, because he's got these other reference points to bring in. Yeah, Myrick and I are working together this Saturday. Okay. I don't know if he knows that yet, but I'll be right here with oh, you. Great. Uh, and to your point about Kiffin's composition, it felt like something I'd I had never heard it before, but it felt like something I'd been sitting with for a while. A very, yeah, comfortable. I was gonna say familiar, but comfortable is a better word. Very comfortable. Uh, definitely something I wanted to I wanted to bathe in it a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's very Wayne Shorter-esque in that the harmony, you look at it and it's not what you're used to seeing, mm. but when you listen to it, it evokes that, that sound that makes sense. So it's, it's surprisingly complicated if you look at the charts. Like, there's a lot going on there. I'm glad you bring up charts in jazz music. It may have been you. I've spoken, spoken about this in the past, but I walked around in your rehearsal just to look at what's on the page. Very different from if someone puts a sheet of music in front of me. How do you read what's on the sheet in front of you and then interpret what the composer meant you to play? Well, I, I mean, I'll jump in on myself on that. Uh, it's something that you have to do in multiple stages. Mm. You can, it's one thing to sight read it, but you don't capture the emotion when you're sight reading in the same way. So for myself, and I think the others probably agree, but for myself, the initial read is just to kind of get a sense of the music itself and understanding you know, the chords, the melody, you know, the basics. And then a second playthrough, I really try and focus more on how, what can I contribute mm. to this? How can I take this? and expand upon it. The same way that a painter would do that, and starting with kind of a blank canvas, they have a general idea, and then how can I expand on this idea, add more color, more depth, more interest. And um, those are all things that I'm constantly trying to search for, is color and depth, and uh, that emotional pull that we talked about tonight. So, so you know, that. Trader, but another thing in jazz music, um, Doug Richards at VCU mm. was, was a tremendous inspiration to mm. me as was Tony Garcia, mm -hmm. J.C. Cool, and mm -hmm. Skip Gales, and all those guys. Oh, boy. But one of the things that Doug would talk to us, talk to all the jazz students about, is when Duke Ellington wrote his music, he would put the name of the player on the score. Wow. It's not just trumpet three. Well, yeah. It's so-and-so. And so that's the same thing that I do and with, with these kinds of charts. When I think of Who's going to play this chart? I think Joe's on piano. So this is the way to communicate to him. Mm. And one of my other composition mm. professors at VCU said, music is, a, is, is you're, 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 you're communicating. That, that score that you're looking at, communicate. Now, if you put a tremendous amount of detail on there, then the brain is not going to be able to process it fast mm -hmm. enough to actually perform. Mm -hmm. If you put too little detail, then you're not communicating enough. So it's very artistic. You have this real sweet spot of communicating just enough and no more mm. for that person. For that person. Very different from when someone hands me a piece of Baroque music and says, sight singer right now. They, totally different. They yeah. told me what to do right here on this page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before we wrap up our, our conversation, I'm always interested to learn what it has, what it was like for you as musicians to enter a phase in world history with a pandemic unsure of what your craft was going to look like coming up. How did you make it this, this long? Did you get together during the time? 
Cool. We definitely, I do remember trying, but from my personal tale, during the pandemic, it was a lot of having to step back and look at what I was doing before, and how can I make this time work for myself? So I actually came out of the pandemic a better musician than mm. I was before. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I know we, we tried a Zoom thing, and it just, with the phasing and everything, it, yeah. it just didn't work very well. Um, I think what we did, or at least what I did, is I thought more about the compositional process, and that's when I started writing mm. during the pandemic, and I wrote uh, three or four charts and would ship them off to Kiffin or Myrick to do some arranging within, but I would write like the lead line and the bass line and the percussion, mm -hmm. and then uh, Myrick or Kiffin would put in, you know, a nice jazz chord structure that would work with that, uh, because I just don't have the training to do that. and I'm. I feel really fortunate to be in this band with these musicians. They are just fantastic musicians. I'm very fortunate. I cheated. I started a whole new career on top of all this, <laughs> uh, which unfortunately I can't talk too much about. But, um, but yeah, I ended up doing an entirely new venture and then finding that in order for me to stay happy with what I was doing and to really enjoy my life as a whole, I really needed to make sure that I was focusing on the creativity as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up kind of finding my way back with the group after taking a little bit of a break to get settled in to my new roles and um, just realized that there was no way that I could live my life without music. So mm. came back and. Same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have my music. I think yeah. Myrick maybe took the best uh, use of his time. He dropped an album during. <laughs> Well, well done, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for me, um, I have three kids and am happily married. And the first thing is we became much closer as a family. Yeah. My kids were at home, virtual school. So I got to spend time with the kids, playing games, teaching them stuff, my, my, all kinds of stuff. I won't get into the details. So that was um, a, a real silver lining in yeah. bringing us closer together. And we all pitched in as a family to work to work closer as a family and achieve things as a family. That really wasn't our focus before that. And no. then the other thing, of course, I spent, um, I, like I have like three more gigs this weekend. So I mean, when when the gigs are, when, when everything's open and the gigs are happening, it's like gig, 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 business, yeah. business, business. Yeah, so when the, when, when the pandemic was here, I didn't have any gigs for a year. So I got to just focus on music, writing for big band, for small band, all kinds of different ensembles, recording, learn all kinds of stuff. So was, in a way, like Joe, I came out a much better musician and, and my talent stack, I got deeper. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about gigs coming up. It's one of my great joys to be doing this, to provide a gig yeah. every once in a while for somebody who can play. Well, thank you all. I've talked enough. We're eager to hear set two, if you're eager to give it to us. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for the conversation. You, Let's Ron. hear you play. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We're going to start the second set with a Sam Rivers tune called Beatrice.
Our uh, bass player, Kiffin, wrote the next song. It's called The Old Man's Tale. I'm not sure if that's for Patrick or for me. No, no, no. <laughs>
the last tune is a little boogaloo I write, I wrote. We call it Dog Bone Boogaloo. Richmond, Virginia, and beyond. Thank you for joining us for another evening in a, a time of year where days become shorter and the heat is beginning to fade. Thank you, Blue Orchid, for reminding us that jazz is still hot 
<laughs> we can still warm ourselves up by the fire of this craft we call music. B.J. Brown, one more time we've done it. Thank you for bringing us such fine musicians. Dominion Energy, thank you for allowing us in your way to keep this production going. Remember Tommy Productions on the other end of those cameras. They're here again. See, not used to my mask yet again, folks. And of course, Chris is up in that booth mixing the sounds we hear. Those of you at home, thank you for loving with us. Thank you for listening to us. And thank you for learning from us in Richmond, Virginia, from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts on the Leslie Cheek Theater State. Look, this thing has come down. This has been our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe. I'm Robert Fennard. Good night. <laughs>